Z-Sonic, the heart of your system. Alright guys, Dominic here for Kitgu, and a few weeks ago when we first reviewed a GTX 1650, we actually looked at a card from Gigabyte that had a supplemental 6-pin PCIe power connector. That is significant because at the time when 1650 launched, the fact that you could get cards that got all of their power through the PCIe slot, that was actually one of the kind of one of the more prominent features of the card as a whole. But at launch, we looked at a card which did after all have one of those 6-pin power connectors. So today we are actually following up on that initial review by looking at this card here. It is the Palette GTX 1650 Storm XOC. So as you would probably have guessed by now, it is indeed a 1650 that does not have an extra power connector. That being said, it is still a factory overclock model. The core has been increased by 60 megahertz over the reference spec bringing the rated boost clock to 1725 megahertz and in the UK this card will set you back 150 pounds. So the thing we're really going to be looking at today is how much of a difference does it make that this doesn't have a power connector and can that change our overall opinion of GTX 1650. Well starting with the design the first thing to note really is just how small this card is. You could probably already be noticed just by the sheer size of it on the table next to me, it is absolutely tiny. In fact, if we give you the official dimensions, it measures just 145 millimeters long, 90 millimeters wide, and then 40 millimeters thick. So I think it's, pro it's definitely the smallest graphics card I've ever reviewed personally, and I'd probably go out on a limb and say it is the smallest graphics card Kit Guru as a whole has ever reviewed as well. Just to kind of put this into perspective and give you a better idea of just exactly what those dimensions mean, here I've compared the card to a GTX 1060 Founds Edition, which is itself, you know, not actually that big of a card, but when you look at this palette next to it, the, it makes the GTX 1060 look absolutely humongous. The, the palette 1650 is just that small. Now, the palette's really been able to do this by the fact that they have gone for a 75 watt TDP GPU, so no extra power connector means, you know, there's a fixed power limit in place, so obviously less heat, so really they don't actually need that much space for the cooler. Um, there's only a single 70 millimeter fan as well, so it's not a big fan, and there's only one of them. That being said, we are going to come to thermals later on. We'll also take the card apart to get a closer look at the heatsink. Now, as for the rest of the card, it is really actually very simple. Palette's really kind of gone for a no frills approach. So it's basically just a black plastic shroud with no extra frills or features. So there's no lighting of any kind, be it RGB or, you know, fixed color. Um, there's also no back plate. So if you flick it over, we only get a look at of the rear PCB. And like we have already mentioned a few times, there is no extra PCI power connector for this card. There are just a couple of other interesting things to point out though. Uh, the first is if we flip the card over to its front side, you can see there is actually only one PCIe bracket. That being said, this is still a dual slot card because it does have that 40 millimeter thickness which comes from the shroud and the heatsink. So it will still occupy two slots in your case, but there is only one PCIe bracket. What that does mean though is that we have a very limited selection of display outputs. Here there's only one HDMI and then one DVI-D. So in other words, there is no display port. That's not really the end of the world, but one thing it does mean is that you can't actually use this 1650 with an adaptive sync monitor. So back at CES 2019, Nvidia announced that its GeForce GPUs would now be able to work with kind of what we would know as free sync monitors as they finally implemented support for adaptive sync. But for Nvidia, that is only through DisplayPort. So you can't actually use that over HDMI with a GeForce card. So that really is just one thing to note with this Palette 1650. You won't be able to plug it into a FreeSync monitor and get the best of that no tearing technology. So generally as a whole, it is a pretty basic card, but what about the PCB? So to take it apart, you really need to remove the four screws that are holding the heatsink in place, and then we get access to the very tiny PCB. Again, Palette's really not done too much here. It's a two plus one power phase configuration, which is pretty much the least we would expect for a 1650. And then we can also see that our four gigabytes of GDDR5 memory, those chips come from Micron. 
Lastly, if we get a look at the GPU die, we can see this is of course labeled TU117-300-A1, and we know it is the TU117, which is the foundation for the GTX 1650 graphics card. With the card disassembled now, we can also get a look at the heatsink, and this is a very basic unit, which actually straight away reminded me of the Intel stock coolers, which they would bundle with, you know, kind of the i3s or the i5s, kind of small, not very impressive looking things. So it's basically just a small circular heatsink. There's no heat pipes or anything like that. Just a kind of a piece of aluminium metal with a few fins cut into it. And that is pretty much it. Moving on now to look at our gaming performance. We're going to be showing you our 1080p charts here in this video. Although we do have 1440p and 4K charts if you head over to kitguru.net. And you'll also find our full testing methodology over there as well. One interesting thing to look at when we get the charts up is going to be how this Palette 1650 compares to the Gigabyte 1650. That Gigabyte one is the one we looked at uh, kind of just a couple of days after 1650 launched. And it is a card that has a supplemental 6 pin PCI power connector. So kind of the difference in performance between both of those 1650s is going to be something we're going to look at closely once we get our charts up. If we cut right to the chase though, now we do have the charts up. It's actually the Palette card performed a lot closer to the gigabyte than I thought. In fact, across essentially almost all of our games, it performed within a single frame of the Gigabyte 1650. In fact, the biggest difference between the two cards when gaming at 1080p was just 1.3 FPS, and that came in Far Cry 5. So really, they perform very, very similarly, and that is definitely a good thing for this palette, considering it's actually a much smaller card and it doesn't have that extra power connector as well. That being said, RX 570 is still consistently faster across the board. Um, that obviously hasn't changed from our initial review, but it is worth pointing out it is on average 15% faster than this Palette 1650. It does vary a little bit, so in titles like Deus Ex, Mankind Divided and also Battlefield 5, we do see even bigger gains for the RX 570, but then in titles like Ghost Recon Wildlands and Far Cry 5, the difference is a little bit less, but still, it was always at least a 5 FPS gap in favour of the RX 570. The last thing to touch on now in terms of the car's performance is average clock speed under load. And while the rated boost clock is 1725 megahertz, we actually saw the card average 1894 megahertz, so almost 900 megahertz. That puts it about 70 megahertz slower than the Gigabyte 1650 we've already been mentioning a few times throughout this review. So it's a little gap, not big though, and it is just enough to explain why we're seeing just that kind of small difference in performance between both 1650s. Moving on now to look at other aspects of this card's performance. Earlier in this review, we kind of mentioned how basic the card's cooler is. The heatsink is pretty small and not really that sophisticated looking, and there's only a 70 millimeter fan. Well, it turns out you don't really need anything more than this to cool a GTX 1650, as this card actually peaked no hotter than 63 degrees under load. That is still four degrees hotter than the Gigabyte 1650, but considering that is actually a much bigger card, it's also a dual fan card, 63 degrees is still a really impressive result and it is still running very cool for this 1650. On top of that, it's not even like the single fan is having to work particularly hard to achieve those temperatures. In fact, noise levels didn't even reach 40 decibels. They peaked kind of, I think it was around 39.5 decibels was the highest uh, volume output I saw from this card. So again, that makes it one of the quieter cards on test and even quieter than that Gigabyte 1650. One thing I would say is that there is no fan stop on this card, so the fans don't actually stop spinning when your system's idle or doing kind of like light tasks like web browsing. So that is definitely one improvement I would like to see as there's always kind of a little very quiet but constant kind of hum of the fan in the background. But otherwise it is generally very inoffensive in terms of the noise levels. Now, as for power consumption, total system power draw with this 1650 installed came to just 121 watts. So that's actually 10 watts less than when we had the Gigabyte 1650 installed in our system. And overall, it does make it the least power hungry card on our chart today. Although given this is a 75 watt TDP GTX 1650, I suppose that is to be expected. Now, if we touch on overclocking, this is this was actually a particularly interesting area for me, considering that this is obviously a 1650 with no supplemental PCI power connectors. Therefore, we've got a very fixed power limit. So if you go into the overclocking software, the power limit is already at 100% and it won't go any higher. 
That being said, I actually still managed to do quite well when we came to manual overclocking with an extra 120 megahertz added to the GPU core and then 900 megahertz added to the memory. This actually brought our average clock speed under load up by almost 100 megahertz in the real world with um, an average figure of 1991 megahertz. So not quite two gigahertz, but still a very impressive result for a 1650. That also saw some tangible gains in the real world with a hefty increase to our fire strike score and we also gained about 5 FPS when gaming at 1080p in both Deus Ex Mankind Divided and also Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Thankfully, the GPU temperatures weren't actually affected hardly at all by this extra frequency as they rose by just one degree, and similarly, noise levels only rose, I think they rose by just over a decibel, so really not that much of a noticeable increase. Lastly, as for power consumption, I was expecting a small jump here, but in the end, the increase turned out to be only 4 watts. So again, another trivial increase. So then, kind of wrapping up this review, I have to say, taken on its own, this Palette GTX 1650 is actually a very impressive card. Not only is it incredibly small, but it actually performs basically on par with the Gigabyte 1650 that we reviewed just after launch, which, bearing in mind that this is a card with no supplemental PCI power connectors, and it's just basically a single fan cooler with a very basic heatsink, I think is actually really impressive. On top of that, it's not like it runs hot or loud either. And again, in fact, it's actually impressive in those areas as well. The thing is though, while Palette has certainly built an impressive card, GTX 1650 as a whole just really can't cut it at this price. That's because RX 570 can be found for as little as £125, and that's for a dual fan factory overclock model. GTX 1650, as we know, starts at £138, but this Palit Storm X OC will actually set you back £150. So really what that means is RX 570 is not only on average 15% faster than GTX 1650, but it is also you know, up to 20 or 30 pounds cheaper, depending on the cards you go for. As far as I can see it, the only potential upside for this 1650 is the fact that it doesn't need that extra six pin PCI power connector as we've mentioned. So it could be an easy upgrade for kind of systems which don't have a decent power supply with a six pin power connector. That being said though, I really don't think that is a compelling argument just because like realistically speaking, how many systems over the last few years would have a power supply that doesn't have at least one six pin power connector? Certainly nothing that could be classed as a gaming machine. I'd be very surprised if anyone out there who kind of built their own PC or at least bought a decent pre-built gaming system, I would really think that would have at least one six pin power connector. So kind of I think being realistic, the only kind of system that would actually benefit from a car like this with no external power connector would be a much older kind of OEM style office system, which is probably going to be the kind of system which has a slower, older CPU anyway, where you start seeing some fairly significant CPU bottlenecking. So ultimately, at the end of the day, it really does come down to one thing, extra six pin PCI power connector or not. There is no denying that GTX 1650 is both slower and more expensive than RX 570. And for that reason, any gamer who's looking to spend maybe 100, 150 pounds on their next graphics card, I just really have to recommend going for an RX 570 instead of GTX 1650. So I'm Dominic Fulkagu. This has been my review of Palette's GTX 1650 Storm X OC. Let me know what you think down in the comments. Is there just no point to 1650 or have you been the kind of person who is eyeing it up for an upgrade of an older office system, for instance, which doesn't have that six pin power connector? Do let me know down in the comments and you can also leave us a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. If you're interested, you can also help and support Guru by buying some of our merch. We'll have this link down in the description below. You've got some lovely designs like this one. And if you would like to see some of our content early, you can consider backing us on Patreon. Until then though guys, I'm Dominic Fulkit Guru and I'll see you in the next video.